QSO Today, Episode 400, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Jim Wilson, amateur call sign K5ND. This special episode's host, where Eric and I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio? Do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Just a reminder, Eric will be at the Four Days in May and the Dayton Hamvention next week. If you see him, be sure to say hello. I was the host and interviewed Eric, 4Z1UG, in celebration of episode 200 back in June 2018. Since then, Eric has produced an additional 200 QSO Today podcast episodes, as well as four QSO Today virtual ham expos. I am happy to be back with Eric in this episode 400. Calling 4Z1UG, this is K5ND. Do you copy, Eric? K5ND, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. I copy you loud and clear, Jim. Thank you so much for being the host today. Oh, you're welcome. It's exciting to be here for this episode, but let me repeat, this is episode 400, and it's appropriate to once again interview Eric to more formally catch up with what's happened since our last interview for episode 200. In that interview, you noted it took 12 hours to produce an interview. Have you found any productivity breakthroughs? Well, you know, it's funny. The more you do something, the better you get at it, Jim. But one of the things I've learned to do, it was hard for me to do, and that was I don't delegate work very well because I often think that other people can't do it the way that I can do it. But I've actually found at this point, Ben Bresky has been with me for a few years now, And he does an amazing job editing the podcast, and that makes us both sound brilliant, or makes me and all of the guests sound brilliant. Rachel Pearson now helps me with the back office. There's a fair amount of back office and social media. And so it takes us six to eight hours now to do the podcast. We're also using some tools that we didn't have before, and one of those tools is a thing called Descript.com. So we're using artificial intelligence to edit the show. What that means is the script actually turns our show audio into a transcript. And when we're editing, we edit the transcript. So as we're actually cutting out words or taking out the you knows, the ums, and things like that, the audio actually gets edited at the same time. So that allows us to, with a visual, to be able to see you know, if we're going off on a tangent and move it back. And I think that that's created a tighter show. That's what we're doing better. So now, as I say, it takes six to eight hours instead of 10 to 12 hours. It's still a labor of love. Every time I start approaching an episode like 400, I'm starting to think, boy, do I want to keep on doing this? Frankly, I make this podcast now for an audience, but I've always made it for me because I love talking to people and I love interviewing hams. And so I'm just going to keep doing it, at least from this point, I'm headed into 500. Well, that's interesting. It sounds like you've both outsourced uh, some tasks and uh, automated some tasks. I've lightly been introduced to Descript, but I wasn't aware of its edit the script and edit the audio at the same time. That's a fantastic feature. Well, in interview episode 200, you noted your biggest challenge was finding guests. Has that improved or changed over the past now 400 episodes? Well, you know, it has, Jim. I can tell you that at the beginning of the QSO Today podcast, I was always looking for the movers and shakers, the people who are well-known, they write articles, they are big contesters, they get a lot of accolades from the amateur radio community. And you can tell in the first, you know, two or 300 episodes that, in fact, those were people whose names you recognize. 
But you know what I also discovered was is that I just like talking to people, and I've discovered that if I listen carefully, that most people have a story to tell. And what most of the listeners of the QSO Today podcast don't hear is the, the conversation that I have along the way with the guest in order to get them to talk more about themselves. Because I think a lot of people are kind of hesitant to talk about themselves. It's, maybe it's that Midwestern Methodist mentality that Americans have that it's not polite to talk about yourself. But the fact is, is that I've discovered that most hams have very interesting stories, even if they haven't been hams for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. So you will hear in upcoming episodes hams that have only been licensed for a few years, but they're doing amazing things in ham radio, and they're bringing a fresh perspective that I think needs to be heard. So the short answer is that I'm finding it easier because I'm not as discerning as I was before on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm finding that everyone has a story to tell, and hopefully I'm gaining some skills in bringing those stories out. Yeah, that does sound good. I know myself, part of my journey was uh, working satellites, uh, and I discovered the group of people working the satellites didn't have a lot of tenure in amateur radio, typically, but they were very excited about it, and it was a lot of fun getting on the air and working. It's wide tent of uh, amateur radio with a lot of different folks uh, in it. Well, you know, on that that topic is uh, something that I'd listened to episode 200 to, to help me here. But in that episode, you mentioned your audience was based on survey results that you had done was basically over age 50, licensed 30 plus years, typically extra class license and primarily USA based. Has that changed over the, since episode 200? Well, I think the average age has come down a little bit, and I think that is a result of the Expos, the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expos, because that audience is broader on the one hand. On the other hand, I think the people that enjoy the podcast are still mostly that same crowd. Probably it's due for me to send out a survey of the podcast to find out who's really listening. But my sense and the feedback that I get is that I'm still talking to over 50, licensed a long time, maybe not quite 30 years or more, but licensed a long time, and a higher level of license, extra class, mostly. Okay, very good. Now, in 2020, you started the QSO Today Virtual Expo. Well, what inspired you to start that expo? Well, I think I've talked about this in other places before. It was kind of a whim. The fact was there isn't very many years that I'm actually able to go to America to go to the Dayton Hamvention. But the year 2020 seemed like that that would be the year I could go. There were no conflicts with holidays. There was no problem with my schedule. And so I made all of my reservations early. And then as the pandemic started to take speed, all of these things were beginning to cancel. So it was really kind of a whim to say, you know what, maybe I could create a virtual convention that kind of has all of the elements of a big convention, even looking like a big convention, and just to see if I could do it. And ultimately, it was a challenge for me. I'm locked down anyway. Could I make a virtual convention? And I was kind of thrilled with the results of the first one in terms of the number of people that signed up. I think we had 25,000 registrations. Of course, it was free. We had a good result. I mean, in terms of sponsors and exhibitors that came, it wasn't like any of the big shows, but it was okay. I think we all learned something from that first one in terms of how to interact with people. We always try to improve that. So yeah, I would say that the first one was inspired by this idea of, could I do it? Could I actually pull one off? And that's really how it all started. Oh, very good. Now, you've now done four episodes or expos. How have the goals changed from one to two, three, then four? Well, I think in each of the expos, I felt there was something that could be improved. One of the things that could be improved was the experience, unlike Zoom. Zoom seems to be like a foundational technology that we've all gotten used to since the beginning of the pandemic. 
But what I wanted was for the presenter, in case people are listening who haven't been to the expo, we pre-record all the presentations. And we did that because I discovered with the QSO Today podcast that not everybody has good internet. Some of the most interesting ham radio operators with the most to present are on very poor internet connections. So by pre-recording those presentations, we could ensure that, in fact, those presentations were excellent. In fact, we even had in the first expo, because of the pandemic raging in the summer, in August of 2020, we even had one or two of the presenters do the Q&A on their phones in the hospital emergency room where they were kind of waiting for a family member. So we discovered that was the best way to do that. However, the user experience wasn't always great. The transition between one presentation and another presentation or the transition from the presentation to doing the Q&A. So there was a lot of stuff that we were trying to work out. And in the last, I'd say, four expos, we've tried things. The second expo, I won't say it was a disaster or a failure. I think some people described it that way because I tried to integrate two platforms together to make a better user experience. But it was a learning experience, and I discovered that, in fact, those people that were able to get on to the AirMeet platform to actually have those face-to-face conversations really liked it. So the process of creating four expos has been to improve the user experience so that it got as close to being live without being live. Does that make sense? Well, it does, and I recall I've done two uh, presentations for the Ham Expo, and I like that pre-recording option. I could that way, if something didn't work, I could redo it. Although I mostly I just let it fly here, but I could do it when I wanted to do it. Make sure it was looking good. You guys also had that ability to make sure it fit. So I like that format real well. And yeah, there was I I observed the the second one. I don't think I was. I might have been presenting at that one. Yes, maybe I was. I had uh, a bit of angst uh, that it was going to come off at all, but, but it certainly did. But the Q&A sessions, uh, both of mine went pretty well. Uh, got a lot of audience engagement. Uh, not, I thought it worked re- very well. What would you say has been your biggest success with, with the Ham Radio Expo? The biggest success was the fact that we did it. We were the first ham radio conference to ever do a virtual expo. So, you know, we have that feather in our cap. It started as an experiment, but it keeps going because it has support. Even though that support has kind of come down to about a solid four to 5,000 people that come each time, that's not bad. It's more than I would have thought, you know, when I started out. The... Initial goals, I don't think they've changed over the period of the four, and that was I wanted it to be educational, I wanted it to be informative, I wanted it to be fun. I think that that people with an open mind might find that it's at least two of those three things. That's really, I think, where it's gone for the most part. I still try to streamline the processes each time to make it better so that the interaction between, mostly the interaction between hams, quote-unquote, on the floor is better, that the interaction between sponsors and ham visitors to their lounges is better. The technology is getting better all the time, and I'm always looking at new technology in order to see if we can always improve the experience. I think that's kind of where my thinking is at this point. And now this message from ICOM America. Field Day is coming on June 26th and 27th, and since it is Ham Radio's most popular event, you can be a Field Day leader with ICOM. Connect with nature, connect with friends. You will easily cut through the pileups with a powerful and high-quality ICOM base station, the popular ICOM IC705 Portable, the ICOM IC7300, and the ICOM IC7610 SDR transceivers are the clear choice for contesters and DXers across the globe. 
The ICOM IC705 is the perfect transceiver for hams who enjoy both the indoors and the great outdoors on field day. It is the perfect contesting companion because this base station provides features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters, and it weighs in at just under 2 pounds. Features include a 4.3 inch touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall display. 5 watts with the BP272 battery pack and 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC power source. Single sideband CW, AM, FM as well as full D-Star functionality. Micro USB connector, Bluetooth, wireless LAN and micro SD card slot are all standard equipment. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. And the HM243 speaker microphone is standard equipment. The ICOM IC705 has new accessories now available. The MBF705 desktop stand for just the right viewing angle on your desk and the AH705 optional automatic antenna tuner that covers 1.8 MHz to 50 MHz bands with a 30 meter or 100 foot or longer wire antenna. The ICOM IC7300 is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. This radio changed the way that entry-level HF transceivers are designed. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen display, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. I have the ICOM IC7300, and it is by far the best HF transceiver that I have ever owned. It is always listening to 20 meters CW while I work. The ICOM IC7610 is the SDR transceiver that every ham wants. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out faint signals in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that has changed the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. Features include, but are not limited to, RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, you can be in two places at once, and dual digicell. For more information, click on the banner ad in this week's show notes page to get to the ICOM America website and its fine line of amazing amateur radios. And when you finally go to buy your next ICOM radio, be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. Yeah, it actually brings to mind that you're always uh, pushing the envelope and every once in a while you're going to fall through <laughs> through that envelope. <laughs> but that's when you're on the leading edge, I guess. It or the bleeding, the bleeding edge. edge. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I can understand that. Now, you mentioned the, the second episode, and or excuse me, uh, the, the second expo. Apart from that whole challenge of trying and not quite succeeding, bringing two platforms together, what have been some of the some of the other challenges that you've had to deal with pulling <laughs> off the expo? Well, that March 2021, that was a confluence of everything that could go wrong, could go wrong, right? It was the height of the pandemic across the world. Emanuela, who works with me in the expo very closely, along with Rachel and Ben and Abu Bakar, Emanuela in Italy got the COVID and she was really sick. So she was in and out trying to service the sponsors at the same time that she was sick and in isolation in her Italian apartment. And the weekend of the expo, the programmer that I'm using, who I still use, who was working on not only helping me with the integration of the two platforms, but also all of the customer support and all that stuff, he was intubated Sunday morning of the expo because he couldn't breathe anymore. He was in Algeria, and being intubated in Algeria is probably a little bit different than being intubated in North America. And so... Everything that could go wrong with the technology went wrong. My wife was holding my hand when I finally came on the platform and saw the 
hundreds of messages that were waiting for me and all of the feedback that was coming in, my phone ringing. I still have PTSD, I think, from that weekend. <laughs> on the one hand. On the other hand, believe it or not, when Abu Bakr came out of intubation the next day, they gave him a sack of medication to take home. He and I completely rebuilt the presentation system so that all of those presentations could be easily downloaded and viewed. And at the same time, we made it so that it was also blind person friendly, so that a blind person could easily use a screen reader to read the titles and start the player and control the player with the keyboard. So as a result of that, we had over 100,000 downloads of presentations for the March 2021 Expo. And we kind of felt that, you know, even though there were difficulties on the platform, and they were all my fault, I admitted it, that I screwed it up. In the end, though, a lot of people became, you know, really well informed and educated as a result of those presentations. And so I kind of felt that, that was a success. And being on the bleeding edge has, you know, you lick your wounds and you get up and, you know, you can either say, I won't do this ever again, it was too hard, or my partner, Brad, who's been my friend and partner for the last 41 years, said to me, let's play it a little bit more conservative for August of 2021, and that's what we did. So August came off, it was very successful, I think. So that's kind of what happened. That's pretty remarkable. The illnesses and just everything coming together. and But then really a breakthrough in getting more educational content out to, to more people with those uh, 100,000 uh, downloads. I know that on that on that topic, we, when we spoke earlier this week, you talked about the AQSO Today Academy. Speaking of learning, what is that and, and what are your goals for the Academy? So over the past year, it comes as a result of a number of things. The first thing is I still do the podcast and I'm still talking to hams every week, at least every week. Oftentimes I'll go in a sprint. So I actually have episodes through 404 already in the can just so I can accomplish the traveling that I'm doing. But in the process of doing these interviews for QSO Today and doing four expos, it occurred to me after the March 2021 expo that hams at any level, at any level I'm going to say, but I'm, then I'm going to have some emphasis, thirst for knowledge to be successful in the hobby. And when I hear about people that get their, their first license and they don't have an Elmer and they don't have resources, I often take emails from new hams that say, I don't even know where to begin to look. What YouTube videos should I watch? If they think about YouTube, someone talks about the ARRL. Where is the ARRL? So I actually have a sheet that I prepared that I kind of cut and paste into an email reply that provides resources for new hams to actually find some way to get started. So this QSO Today Academy idea is kind of on the foundation of now over 200 presentations that have been made by amazing ham radio mentors, including yourself, Jim, and an audience of amateur radio operators who either they can't find a local club or the local club doesn't respond to the needs that they have or they want to pursue something in the hobby that is outside of the expertise of the local club. Or it's even someone like you, Jim, who has decided that, you know what, I want to do something like moon bounce. I'm not a moon bouncer yet. Maybe you are, but I'm, I'm using you as an example. I want to go into a subject in ham radio deeper than I could get anywhere else. The idea of the QSO Today Academy, then, is to use this foundation of presentations of mentors who have become connected to the QSO Today enterprise, as it were. I'm not saying that in terms of business, but in terms of this idea that QSO Today can be bigger than just the podcast and the expo. And to bring all these people together so that a conversation can start about, I'm interested in this and I would like to learn more about this and that I can find a mentor that will put together a course of multiple presentations with Q&A and with live feedback 
to build amateur radio expertise. So that's the short paper, the long paper I'm still writing, but to build this on a platform that allows interaction between all of the participants at various levels. So maybe there's a conversation between the mentors that goes on in terms of thinking about, you know, how would we do this, or I need a consult on how I might make a presentation to talk about new HF digital modes. How would we deploy those? You know, what resources do we need? Who could teach that? Who do we know in the amateur radio community that is the expert that we could pull in and get that information? So that's kind of what I'm thinking that the uh, QSO Today Academy could be. Well, that sounds sounds excellent. And you, you know, I've the last presentation I did for the expo was on six meters, and I've done a fair bit on my website on that topic. So I'll get those uh, emails as well. Hey, I'm thinking about six meters, and what should I do? That those sorts of uh, questions, and of course, I respond to them with a big list of uh, links and read this, read that. I don't know if they ever actually do that, or they get a little overwhelmed with my response. But but that is going on out there. I've witnessed it to a smaller scale than than you have, certainly. But people looking for information, they started in ham radio, they've done some things, and they want to go on to the next thing. And, and so they reach out, and it's good to be helping them. And the Academy sounds like a great way to provide that resource uh, for them. So when do you expect to go live with the Academy? Well, so I, I'm doing the final touches now on the platform. So the Academy is actually on a software platform to allow this kind of interaction. And so that platform is being set up and fine-tuned right now. So I hope to have it ready before the summer starts. Oh, very good. That's that's coming up very quickly. Well, now, one of the things that we had talked about earlier is that for the QSO Today podcast and for the the Ham Expo, and I would imagine it may be similar for the Academy, the, the primary audience is in the U.S. Why do you suppose that is, Eric? That's a very good question. It's funny. I actually came to Israel 22 years ago as a marketing VP for a high-tech company. And one of the things that Israeli high-tech companies do is, is they usually tend to go to the United States first. And the reason is because you've got, say, a large audience, 360 million people that speak the same language. So if you go to Europe, you may be going to an audience that's broken up into multiple language groups and finding people with background knowledge and understanding of those language groups means that you have to have multiple people in your organization in order to be able to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So looking at North America, I'm a North American ham. Even though I've been here for 22 years, I'm connected there mentally, spiritually, in terms of ham radio. And so I know American ham radio operators better. And then I think culturally, when I send out invitations to international hams, and I know there's notable exceptions, so if those hams are listening right now, I'm begging their forgiveness if they have a different opinion. But Americans tend to be more open about talking about themselves once you break down the barriers in terms of they're more willing to share. Does that make sense? Yes, it, yes, and, it does. I understand that. And I found a lot of the invitations that I send out to hams in other parts of the world, they don't want to talk about themselves. They would rather remain you know, off the radar. They'd rather just do their thing without being identified. And again, notable exceptions. So that's the reason that I primarily focus on North America. I think that North America is a huge opportunity for ham radio and for learning with almost 800,000 licensed ham radio operators in North America, and the majority of them not on the air, it means that there's more we can do there in order to make ham radio successful. And then I think, finally, that if you can make it in America, you can make it anywhere, meaning that America tends to be, or the United States, when I say America, I'm talking about the United States tends to be the leader in amateur radio from a perhaps worldwide political point of view. 
it has probably the most number of companies that would like to have our amateur radio spectrum on the one hand. On the other hand, it has resources to protect amateur radio and amateur radio spectrum that a lot of countries don't have. So I think that if you can make it lead in America and you can solidify the base in America, then that has positive consequences for amateur radio and the rest of the world. Makes a lot of sense. And it, it also comes to that so many, or I hear from time to time, ham radio operators lamenting the decline of ham radio in the U.S. And they're just not paying attention. <laughs> or they're in a club that very seldom looks outside and tries to bring people in. When I went back to the episode 200 and listened to it, there were three questions that, that I asked in, in that interview that I want to repeat here. We can just see what uh, your thinking may have changed or whatever. But first one, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing amateur radio today? It's a great question. I like to ask that question. Now, it seems to me that most of the answers I get have to do with we're not getting teenagers or we're not getting kids anymore into amateur radio. And I've said this on many podcasts, so I'm almost repeating myself. We live longer now. You know, we live into our 80s and 90s. The average age of lifespan of American males is, I think it's dropped because of COVID for a year or two, but it's still in the high 70s. When we were kids, the mortality age was 67, I think, was what it was in like 1972. So kids were the lifeblood of the hobby. And I remember, you know, the old timers complaining about us, you know, even in the 70s when we became hams. But I think that 35-year-olds that have their families started, that have some money to spend on ham radio and maybe even some time, I think those are the kids. But it was brought to my attention in episode 398 with John Fallows, VE6EY. He brought up a very interesting point, and that is that why do we call it amateur radio? Amateur radio was started 100 years ago, and perhaps it was called amateur radio because we weren't working for the Marconi company or the shipping companies that were putting boats to sea. We're not doing a good job of saying that we're the keepers of this national park that we keep talking about that's amateur radio, the spectrum that we have from D.C. to blue light that we are the caretakers of and how valuable that spectrum is to the advancing of technology the learning that we do, I showed you before we started my all-star node that I whipped up to take with me to the United States when I'm traveling, that having this bandwidth and this ability creates a tremendous opportunity. And I don't think that we know how to tell the general public that what we have and what we do with it and why it's important and how they can use it in order to advance their projects, their knowledge, the f fascination that they could have with their lives and with the physics of it and things like that. So I would say that that I think is the opportunity that we're leaving on the doorstep. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. So a 30-second 30, 30 elevator pitch about uh, what is this hobby that we're engaged in, and starting with uh, the title uh, of it. You touched, uh, too, on um, 
why aren't there 14, 15, 16 year old youth engaged in amateur radio? And it reminded me of a, a, a very purposeful exercise I went through when I was working for Boy Scouts. We did a visioning exercise and they, they actually turned the lights out in the room and we said, OK, I want you to go back to when you were a kid. And for me, that was the 1960s, early 1960s. It said, think about a typical day. Now, think about, pick out a grandchild or one of your children here today and think about their typical day. And the difference was huge. My day was completely up to me in the summers. I'd get on my bicycle and I'd go all over the place getting into all kinds of stuff. But for my grandkids, it's all planned for them. Every place that they go, they, they typically pay to get in to do that activity. It's just completely different. And I'm afraid that our uh, typical ham radio operator is saying, well, God, where, where are the kids? Well, <laughs> they're not doing just wandering around doing whatever happens. They're in organized activities from the start of the day to the end of the day. It's a remarkable change, and I don't think we consciously pay attention to that in our lamenting. But looking on the upside, that the second question that well, I that Jim, I had. Before, oh, be, sure. Before we yes, go there, go ahead. Let me. I'd like to respond to this. It, it's funny. I was having the same conversation with somebody earlier this week. We're sitting in a coffee shop that has a field you know, next to it with bushes and all that stuff. And we were talking about what we did as kids. You're exactly right. We had time to explore. My mother taught me how to catch snakes and lizards, if you can believe that. My mother gave me, for a birthday, an ant farm. And I have <laughs> memories of my mother at the end of a dirt road digging for red ants to put in my ant farm with these ants crawling all over her feet and her legs as she's, you know, doing this because she wants me to have these ants in this ant farm. I didn't do it with my kids. I think it was children on on milk cartons, you know, missing children on milk cartons. I think that we somehow <laughs> yes. got scared as a generation of parents that we were afraid to let the kids out of our organized activities and they don't explore on their own. I mentioned the field next to the coffee shop. And as a kid, I'd be in that field, you know, under those bushes looking for snakes or whatever I could find along with my friends. And if a kid did that today, their mother would go out and say, what are you doing in there? You, there could be snakes in there. So <laughs> Very true. I, Very I true. guess I don't know how to reverse this, but I think in the long term, now I'm being philosophical. I apologize to the audience in the long term, I think that we're not going to be served by it, that too much safety and supervision is going to prevent us from being better than we could be. Yep, I agree. I, I've heard it said many times, the job of children is play. They'll learn more uh, that way than they will in many classrooms, uh, all too many classrooms, actually. So, yeah, it's a big difference. So what most excites you about amateur radio at this moment in time, episode 400 versus 200? Oh, I think we're in the golden age of ham radio. I think that the confluence of the Internet, the technologies available to us, Although with the supply chain issues right now, you know, perhaps getting parts is not the same as it was two years ago, but still it's not bad necessarily. So the ability to get the parts that we need, the, the ability to browse for those parts on the Internet to be able to put something together. My all-star node was built from parts I'd accumulated from various sources over the last few years, and I decided rather than just buy one already put together that I'd whip one up from all the junk that I had. So the confluence of the internet, the ability to go in deep and find information, good or bad information, you have to distill it, the availability of parts, the fact that we're doing a thousand things in amateur radio that we could master. And if we mastered, you know, just one of those things, we have a skill set that is immediately transferable outside of amateur radio. So I think this is an amazing time to be a ham radio operator, 
that anyone who says that ham radio is dying or will be gone in another generation, I don't believe it for a minute. I think that we need to do a better job to educate, a better job to inform, a better job to kind of put ourselves out there. But I think this is an amazing time to be a ham. Well, I would agree with you. And you prompted a memory of for the 2019 uh, World Scout Jamboree. I was I recruited a lot of ham radio operators uh, within World Scouting to come in and operate the station that we put on the air. But one of those was a youth in Liechtenstein, and he was not a ham radio operator. But what he was doing was using an SDR dongle to receive satellite weather satellite images. And so, you know, and the the price of doing that was next, you know, just a few dollars. But he was learning a great deal and he was engaged with with radio and he did it. Well, he got his license when he came to his U.S. license when he when he came to the World Jamboree. <laughs> well, I think that one of the things that we discovered, what is one of those SDR dongles cost? You know, twenty dollars. Exactly. And, and some software. Yeah. So. The cost of doing something outrageously spectacular is nothing now in ham radio. And the themes and variations on it, if you may recall, I think, was it in August, there was a young man who had just gotten a license and he had a great mentor. And that mentor got him into Whisper because he could afford to buy a Whisper transmitter from QRP Labs. So he builds this Whisper transmitter. He's figured out that he can put up this long wire antenna it propagates across the world. He can see it on his cell phone, you know, where he's being heard. And if he moves the end of that antenna around his yard, somehow it changes where he's heard. What an amazing learning experience. And it's not expensive. And it can lay this foundation for him, hopefully, that will say, you know what, I could be an engineer, I could be a whatever. And I'll be fascinated, you know, for the rest of my life with something like this. I think the opportunity is there, and I think it's quite amazing. It, it really is, and it is a golden age. Uh, there's so much to get engaged with. So, uh, and then my last question from, from the previous episode is, what advice would you give a new or returning ham radio operator? I think you should come to the QSO Today Academy as a place to start, but you have to find out about it. So I think that I would give the same advice that many of my guests give, and that is you need to find a radio club when you get your license. Now, the fantastic opportunity is that if you don't have a local radio club or you have a local radio club that doesn't quite do what you want or you have a local radio club that when you walk in the door, nobody knows you're there or at least acknowledges that you know you're there, then you have other opportunities, and that is that there's plenty of clubs now that are available online. But finding a club is key, or finding a community is key to success in anything, including ham radio. So that would be my first piece of advice. The second piece of advice would be you need a live mentor. You need somebody that you can see that you can hand him or her things and she and he can hand those things back to you to show you basic skills, to provide that enough expertise to push you over any hump that you have. If you want to learn something, I've said this on the podcast, I sing. So I've had a teacher that I pay for every week for six, seven years to work on skills, to develop my voice, all that stuff. It's worth paying for, and it's worth paying for because it puts you an order of magnitude ahead as if you were trying to do this yourself on your own. So finding a live mentor, holding the light. You want to fix repeaters? You want to learn how they work? Find the guy that's responsible for fixing the repeaters in your radio club and ask to go on every, every time he has to go to the hilltop to fix it so that you can hold the light, so you can hook up the... SWR, the bird watt meter, so that you can help him with the service monitor. All of this stuff is a way to learn these skills and become a success in ham radio. So having a live mentor, I think, is key. And that would be my advice to newer returning hams. Find the mentor. Pay for it if you have to, if you can. If you can't, then there's plenty of people that are be more than willing to work with you for nothing. All of us old-timers have equipment. 
So don't be shy. That would be my advice. We will return to our guests in just a moment. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. My brother-in-law recently studied for his ham exam, and I sat down with him. He's in Kansas City, so it's about a 10-hour drive from here. But I sat with him and helped him over a couple of days to to prep for his exam. And he joined a club, and I'm not sure about the mentor to keep him going. He he asked me questions from time to time, but I think it would be very helpful for him to have a personal somebody to work with. I think that most hams, new hams, have only seen a very narrow view of the hobby. If they came in through, you know, CERT or they came in through, you know, one of the weekend ham cram exams, maybe there was something that they saw that they want to get the license to be able to do that. But I think the majority of new hams, and I hope that they'll have some feedback and they can, new hams can tell me that I'm wrong or I'm right, they haven't seen the full spectrum of what ham radio is about. I haven't seen like, you know, this is ham radio video recently that kind of creates an opportunity to kind of ignite these ideas for a full spectrum. I think with the expo, I try to get enough variety that people can get a sense that there is a spectrum. But I think that if your brother-in-law sees the whole spectrum and says, you know, I'd like to target one thing, Jim, then you have something to work with. If he's kind of hey, I'm, nobody's answering my two-meter handheld when I'm kerchunking the repeater in town, then I think we have a problem. Yeah. Well, you, you remind me, too, something that the ARRL has uh, done is publishing, I'm pretty sure it's On the Air magazine. It's a new magazine yes. that they've come, it, it might be have been out for two years now, maybe. But I've been uh, very excited about that magazine, though. The reading level that it adheres to, the very short introductions to topics that are can connect with from having no background really at all. They've done an extraordinary job with that, and we need to get it into the hands of more people is, is the thing that needs we, to happen. We don't there. have newsstands anymore, right? for the most part. (laughs) That's true. So you can't, you know, if you're browsing, you know, all of the field and stream, you know, all of the magazines that used to be browsable. I, as a kid, I would, if my mother was shopping in the supermarket, I was in the magazine rack looking for popular science, popular electronics, you know, all of those magazines. But you don't see those, those opportunities anymore. And On the Air magazine is a great magazine. It should be in places where someone casually can find it and pick it up. Maybe in airports. Airports is a place where people browse because they have a lot of time on their hands. Maybe that's an idea for the IRRL, but it might be good for us because perhaps more people would say, hey, well, this is really interesting. Yeah, or every school library um, or yes. public library would be a, a, a good way to, to do that as well. I haven't been to a library in years, and it used to be my favorite place. So do they still exist? Does a public school still have a library? I don't yeah. even know whether a public school has a library or that the you know a, a library now is a bunch of computers. Hopefully the listeners will inform us. Yeah, my community library here is uh, doing a fabulous job of uh, keeping me posted through emails of all the programs that they offer for youth and adults and genealogy programs and and things like that. So they're doing, at least this community library is doing a a great deal. But but like you, I haven't been in a few years. So uh, maybe a ham radio presentation in the library is a... Who would have thought of a library as a venue for making it like a general presentation if it already has a lecture series based on what things are happening, mm-hmm. what people are doing. People you, need hobbies again as a way to oh, readjust. Well, that's that's a good – you jogged another – right next door to that uh, library complex is the uh, community center that has a huge array of programs of Tai Chi and all of those sorts of things and lectures and, and you name it. And certainly – and it's typically for seniors or 
actually I'm pretty sure it's for open for anybody, but that would be a good place to pedal amateur radio as well. Right. I think you've hit on a couple of things. I think the Boy Scouts is a great opportunity. I think it's still an opportunity, right? Yes. Oh, yes. I think I was telling you the other night that we have an American Boy Scout troop here, and uh, I think there is still a communications merit badge. There's still a language merit badge, which I think Morris Code qualifies for as a language. Well, yeah, There's first there's the radio merit badge. Right. And that last year, it was roughly uh, 3,000 scouts that earned that. This year, as uh, some of the restrictions have come off, it's right at 4,400, uh, sc- or not this year, 2021. I was comparing 2020 to 2021. 3,500, I think it was in 2020, 4,400 in 2021. So uh, so it's still uh, something of interest to youth. And there's the there are interpreter strips, what they're called. And so if you know Spanish and can pass a test, you get to sew uh, on your uniform, Espanol. But we also managed to get a Morris Code interpreter strip in there, which is all legitimate and approved, but it's five words per minute. And 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 in in scouting, nothing really happens unless it's a patch that you can sew on your uniform. So there is a, so there is that patch, and there's also an AWRL service to scouting award for adult leaders, and uh, has this set of requirements that you can uh, fulfill and be nominated to to earn that award. It too is a patch that you can sew on. Any any other topics before I bring this to a close? I would like to thank the listeners for hanging in with me for 400 episodes. I'd certainly like to thank ICOM America. ICOM America has been an amazing sponsor. It's because of ICOM America that I'm able to offload some of the work that allows me to continue making the podcast. So at this point, without them, I wouldn't have been able to come this far. So I wanted to say that I appreciate their support over the years and their continued support. Well, and I tip my hat to ICOM America as well for their support of scouting and amateur radio and scouting. It's been a huge help to us beginning in 20, 2012 and continuing to this day, their support of uh, amateur radio and scouting. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time, your insight, and your ongoing efforts to provide interesting and insightful interviews with the leaders in all facets of amateur radio. We also greatly appreciate your work to serve the amateur radio community with the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo and the upcoming QSO Today Academy. For Z1UG, this is K5ND73, and we'll look for you down the log. Yeah, K5ND, this is 4Z1UG. Thank you so much, Jim, for having me. 73. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I want to thank Jim Wilson, K5ND, for acting as this week's host in episode 400. Jim is very busy contributing to amateur radio and has an amazing website. I will put a link to Jim's website in this week's show notes page. I will send an email out soon announcing more information about the QSO Today Academy. Stay tuned. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates of the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. I'm updating it as I have more information. My thanks to ICOM America for their continuing support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their link in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this episode or any of the episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor, monthly or annually, by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. Please note that your contributions are now listed on the show notes page under the ICOM banner. This list does not show Buy Me a Coffee contributions. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It will make a big difference as we now embark on getting to episode 500. 
QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, and in the iTunes Store, and now a host of podcast services and applications. We are Podcasting 2.0 compatible, and my podcast player of choice is now Fountain. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who, as the consummate sound artist, makes this host and his guests always sound brilliant. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.